My name is Courtney Dentlinger. I'm the Vice President of Customer Service and External Affairs for Nebraska Public Power District and want to welcome you all in to learn more about hydrogen hubs and what the opportunity means for the state of Nebraska. So at this point in time, I want to introduce our panelists today. I'm going to go in the order in which they're speaking, and Anna Wishart is going to kick us off. Senator Wishart uh, has been a longtime public servant, serving not only in the legislature, but previously on the Lincoln Airport Authority. She's incredibly community-minded and a fantastic consensus builder. Uh, she's been with Monolith now. One year. One year, um, and we've had the pleasure of working with her on our hydrogen hub activities. So Anna's gonna kick us off, and I'll introduce John Swanson after that. Well, thank you, Courtney, and it is so good to be here today. Um, you know, it's really put it in perspective when I say I was born and raised in Lincoln when my former coach, <laughs> found me here just a minute ago to say hi. So what a blast from the past. You, most of you probably had a chance to see Amy Ostermeyer, who's the VP of development, speak about the progress that Monolith is uh, on in terms of Nebraska. So I won't go into too much detail, but before we dive into sort of the hydrogen hub opportunity and initiative we have here in Nebraska and, and on the federal level, I thought it'd be good to just step back and, and talk a little bit about hydrogen. Now, I will fly through these uh, pretty quickly because some of these slides you saw today with, with Amy and then John will get to the meat of the, por of the uh, presentation today. You know, when I, so I've spent, as Courtney said, the majority of my career on the, on the public service side, on uh, serving as an elected official. But I always knew I've got two years left in the, in the legislature and knew that, that after that I wanted to go and work in the private sector in an industry that not only had the chance to really support uh, economic development in the state of Nebraska, good jobs uh, in particular, but also had a chance to really impact the world on, and, and really the environment on a global level and help us meet those 2050 decarbonization goals. And so it was really exciting to have Monolith grow in our backyard here in Nebraska. And you know, once our expansion is complete, Amy didn't say this, but we will be the largest clean hydrogen, hydrogen facility in, in the country. So when I was applying for the job, I spent some late nights <laughs> looking up what is hydrogen. I remember like, you know, from chemistry class looking at the periodic table, but never had I really understood how impactful hydrogen is for our lives today in terms of a lot of the su supplies, the vital supplies that we rely on today but how impactful it's going to be on a, on a global level in terms of helping the world meet its 2050 decarbonization goals. So as Amy talked about, but she didn't show this pie chart, and this, this was really one of the first things that our CEO, Rob, showed me. To get a picture around what we're looking at when we're talking about how the world is going to be able to continue to expand our consumption of energy and expand our mobility and continue to do the things that we all love to do with more and more population being able to do that, how we're gonna be able to do all of that while reducing our emissions. And hydrogen is going to play an absolute vital role in this. As Amy discussed earlier, when you look at this pie chart of where the emissions come from in the world, you know, I was very familiar before this job with electricity you know, because of wind and solar, because of coming to these conferences as a senator. And obviously familiar with, with transportation in, in terms of uh, electric vehicles. But I wasn't as familiar with the emissions associated with a lot of other uh, types of industry in our world. And again, Amy showed this, that's where hydrogen is gonna play a role. You know, obviously wind and solar, and other clean forms of energy play a vital role in decarbonization, as well as the innovations going on in battery storage. But in order for us to get to that full 
decarbonization goal, that full pie chart, hydrogen will be one of the key pillars in doing that. And as Amy discussed, it's everything from heavy duty trucking, uh, marine fuel, ammonia. So in this chart here, what you're seeing is everything in green is hydrogen and what's in yellow is, is ammonia fuel. Um, so these are all of the areas, just some of them, this is not an exclusive list, uh, in which hydrogen is going to be a key solution for decarbonization. And this isn't something way out in the, distance in the distant future. There are innovations and large scale production going on right now um, of hydrogen. Uh, and what we're doing is figuring out how to clean up the hydrogen production um, so that there's zero emissions associated with all of this type of industry. And that's where Monolith comes in. And I, again, I'm not gonna go into detail on this because Amy explained our process, but what is key when we're talking and when John is talking about a uh, clean hydrogen economy, what the, the federal government has really pushed for all of us to do in terms of their policy and investment that's going on is to support hydrogen technologies that are able to achieve a significant emission reduction. So when you're looking at this chart, the traditional way of making hydrogen, it's called steam methane reform. Other people call it grain hydrogen. As Amy said earlier today, it produces a significant amount of emissions. So there's technologies that allow for carbon capture that you'll hear about. Those will play a role in reducing the traditional way of making hydrogen, the emissions associated with that with reducing those. And then you get to monolith technology where we have no emissions associated with our facility. The only upstream emissions associated with our process is in natural gas leakage upstream. Um, but as Amy discussed, if you blend in renewable natural gas, we will have a sub-zero carbon intensity score. And then electrolysis is another key player. And so what I wanted to end on is this is a map that we used to show before the Inflation Reduction Act. And this is a map that showed that the world has woken up to clean hydrogen. It's not just this country that is talking about hydrogen as a key resource for decarbonization. And a lot of countries are looking at it a resource, not even looking at the, the carbon reduction abilities, but just for energy and transport and all of the things that they need because they didn't hit the lottery like the United States did in terms of our natural resources. I, this map is going to change significantly because of the federal policy that was just discussed uh, at the last session. The Inflation Reduction Act in, and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which we're gonna talk about today, uh, has put a significant amount of investment into clean hydrogen production in the United States. We are now the most business friendly country in the world by far in terms of clean hydrogen investment. And when I go to conferences with major financers of massive projects, the entire world's attention is on building clean hydrogen in the United States because of these policies that have come into play. So this is gonna be over the next series of years, a really exciting time to be in the United States working on clean hydrogen projects. And so with that, I'll turn it over to a very exciting project that's right in front of us in terms of hydrogen hubs. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, as Anna mentioned, we're gonna ask John Swanson to come up here in just a moment to talk very specifically about the hydrogen hub opportunity that we have for the state of Nebraska uh, through what the feds put forward through the IIJA. Um, uh, I wanted to introduce, take an opportunity to introduce John now. He's the director of um, Generation Strategies and Research at Nebraska Public Power District. He's been with us for 34 years. Um, we. Uh, lovingly refer to him as our chief rock turner. If there's a new technology, John is out there pursuing it. In fact, many, many years ago, uh, John and his team were introduced to Monolith out of state 
And that was the start of a wonderful relationship and one of the reasons that Monolith ended up coming to the state of Nebraska and establishing their headquarters here. Um, John's leading the, John and his team are leading the hydrogen hub efforts uh, from MPPD's side. And I wanna turn it over to him now to talk very specifically about the hub initiative, uh, the timelines, the opportunities, and then we're gonna have some time at the end uh, for wrapping things up and to take all of your questions. John? Thank you, Courtney, and thank you. Of course, it went the wrong way. Here we go. And thank you, Anna. Uh, to say this is John Swanson's team, this is John Swanson's effort, that, you know, that, that sells it way short. There are a lot of people that are involved in this. I'm not here because of my efforts. I'm here because of their efforts. So I acknowledge a lot of the people in this room that have uh, helped us get to where we are today in terms of the overall hydrogen hub effort. So jumping in. Again, the wrong way. There we go. Mid-Continent Clean Hydrogen Hub. That is the name of the organization, if you will, that we're putting together. Uh, Mid-Continent, for obvious reasons. And you see the blue to green. Uh, that is intentional, uh, with the belief that in order to accommodate where we're headed with the hydrogen economy, you're gonna have to start with some blue. And blue is simply from other sources with the carbon captured. So it's a low intensity carbon hydrogen, but it's not as low as, for instance, as the monolith work will be uh, eventually. But anyway, um, and then the, the trademark, the TM, I'll get onto that in just a minute. It is legitimately and authentically trademarked. Uh, the federal legislation, the as, as Anna mentioned, the IIJAX, uh, IJA, uh, is law. This isn't something we're waiting on Congress to act on or somebody's position or somebody's motivation, whatever the case may be. This is real. Uh, it's part of an $8 billion U.S. Department of Energy uh, piece of legislation for clean hydrogen hubs. And interestingly enough, you see that number go from eight to seven when we actually start dividing up the money amongst the various hubs. Don't know what happened to that billion dollars, but when it came out, it was an $8 billion program. Uh, subsequent and then to the passing of that legislation, Governor Ricketts, with the help of a lot of folks in this room, uh, passed LB 1099. And that was in the March timeframe of this year. And that simply says that Nebraska is going to play. That's all it says. Uh, the governor will appoint a committee and uh, that committee will see that Nebraska participates in whatever that may mean as we move forward. So it's not just Nebraska exclusive. It's not just uh, Nebraska soul alone. It's what does it mean to the state of Nebraska? Can and how do we play in this regional hub concept of the DOE? Um, we have been working then with a number of parties to develop that concept. And we're going to show you some of those folks now. So the, the governor appointed 1099 committee. Uh, you see the names and you'll see the companies. Uh, so Tom Kent, NPPD, CEO. Um, it's primarily been, I'd say, a quarterback effort by NPPD to this point. Uh, why? Because we see the opportunities for hydrogen and decarbonization of our world. We also see the economic development opportunities that hydrogen is going to bring uh, to both the ag sectors and other manufacturing sectors of the state. Um, Mark, the president of Farm Bureau. Hmm, why is Farm Bureau on a hydrogen hub team? Uh, good question. Except for the fact that we're Nebraska. And consequently, we're using and magnifying, if you will, the resources we have available to us here in this state in order to accommodate and play in this hydrogen hub. So obviously you bring the farming community into that discussion. Uh, Monolith, Amy, you heard speak this morning. Amy's on the team. You've heard all about Monolith. We're very fortunate, by the way, to have Monolith here. Uh, nobody else in the world is doing what they're doing, and they're doing it now. The world is trying to catch up to Monolith. You see a lot of imitators, a lot of people trying to come up, up to par of what these guys are already doing, but no, nah, they're years behind what's going on down here in Hallam, Nebraska. Uh, Tallgrass Energy, there's a good one. What's the natural gas company doing here with a Nebraska hydrogen hub? Great questions. Uh, they're interested in making hydrogen. Uh, Anna mentioned the autothermal reformation where you take natural gas and you make hydrogen from that and capture the CO2 off of that process. So they're interested as part of that. They're also interested in, as you are well aware, uh, it's public information that they're gonna be converting the pipeline uh, in Nebraska, the Tallgrass pipeline, Trailblazer, excuse me, Trailblazer pipeline from natural gas service to CO2 service. And that CO2 then will, will take a trip out to Wyoming where it will find a permanent home. Scott Moore, Union Pacific. So the rail industry is interested in decarbonizing their fleet, if you will, in the way they move and manage cargo across the United States. And then uh, uh, Chad also then from Warner Enterprises, those are the blue trucks <coughs> with the yellow printing that everybody sees going up and down interstate. Uh, Warner has already taken steps and they're public uh, in terms of 
500 uh, Cummings engines for their diesels. Well, not diesel, well, they're still sort of diesels. Uh, but anyway, for their fleet going forward. And they're gonna be using hydrogen, I think within two years or thereabouts. So what you see is the sourcing of the hydrogen. You see the people that make and develop the hydrogen. And then you see the people that want to use the hydrogen. And those are important elements for a hydrogen hub. Uh, we've kind of busted up in terms of the formation of what the hub looks like then. There's an ag, energy, transportation, and the environmental, social, and economic development. I can talk ag, energy, and transportation all day long. If you want to talk about that last one, we just happen to have the two experts sitting at this table that can tell you all about the EJ efforts and all the kinds of stuff that will be a part of this application going forward. In fact, a rather large part of this application going forward. So under ag, food security. No surprise there. And that's something that Nebraska can bring to the table. You know, we feed the world, literally. And consequently, if we want to maintain that position and help out as best we can, uh, let's securitize our ammonia supply. Let's securitize all those kinds of other things that allow us to do what we do so well. Renewable natural gas has already been mentioned. Ethanol and ammonia are also part of the hydrogen hub in terms of how ag contributes to the production of the hydrogen. Um, natural gas paralysis is the monolith process. Uh, auto thermal steam reforming, that's what we talked about with uh, the monolith folks, or excuse me, with the uh, tall grass people already. And then ethanol. We're evaluating a couple different opportunities that actually converts ethanol to a CO2 stream and hydrogen. So an interesting opportunity there. Products then, things that you can do with it. Well, there's a lot of renewable diesel opportunity that comes from either soy or from corn oil. Uh, the big one, uh, the, if anybody knows anything about ethanol in the room, a lot of ethanol plants are focused and pointed towards sustainable aviation fuel. And then green chemicals as well. Uh, methanol is a product that uh, uh, has opportunity in the transportation sectors and in the chemical sectors. Uh, urea is something that's used in the ag sectors, et cetera, and so forth. So the more you green up the things that go into the products of making the ag products in the state, the greener you make those products. Who cares? Why do we care? Well, example. Um, there's folks that um, in this state use a lot of corn syrup and they make, uh, let's say, beverages and soft drinks with those corn syrup products, okay? Um, they're interested in the carbon footprint of that corn syrup because they want to advertise and broadcast that to their constituents or to their, supply, to, their, to their buyers that they are managing and have a negative carbon footprint in the soda that you're drinking. So that interest just bleeds its way through in all other avenues in terms of the corn, the grain, the animal production, traceability of the, of the carbon footprint all the way through. Transportation, again, uh, sustainable aviation fuel for the airlines. Uh, maritime, I love it. Thank you. Anna did me a favor by showing that slide of that, that ship pushing the, the equipment over the oceans. All those big ships, all those big cargo ships that you see today, a majority of them have what's called a Wartzilla engine in them that provides their transportation motive. That's their energy. And today, most of those are powered by something called bunker fuel. It's a heavy sulfur and a heavy carbon-based fuel, and it's cheap. That's why they use it. Well, they're under a lot of pressure there, too, to decarbonize and desulfurize. Well, that really limits you in terms of things you can turn to. Well, guess what? Ammonia and methanol are two of those things you can turn to that satisfy both of those, those new limitations, if you will. We have a solid relationship with the folks at Wartzilla. In fact, Wartzilla is on our team. And uh, we look to the Wartzilla people and those engines and their capabilities for hydrogen, for natural gas, for um, methanol, for ammonia and other fuel types to possibly be part of this hub and how we would generate electricity going forward into the future. Uh, we mentioned the rail already with the, uh, the Union Pacific folks. Uh, they are looking at hydrogen fuel cells, believe it or not, they work in that kind of a load capacity. But right now, probably more emphasis on renewable diesel because it's a drop in <laughs> fuel. Trucking them, we mentioned Werner Enterprises, also looking at hydrogen fuel cells and then also renewable diesel for them as well. And again, if anybody wants to talk about the social, economic and development buttons, we have the experts sitting right here. The only thing I'll say is that you fill out the application, you go through the work, you hand it into the DOE to be graded, if you will. They look at all the applications from all across the United States. 40% of that final grade you get on that paper from the DOE deals with that last bullet. So doesn't just mean, you know, Swanson, how I make it, how I use it, how I transport it, how I, how, 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 how. It, it talks about how that is going to be used to create a new environment, if you will, around this new technology for the betterment of the state and all those involved. Uh, thank you. I cleaned up the spelling error, but apparently it still didn't work. Clean hydrogen. Anyway, you can see the graphic. Um, this is out of the DOE documentation. 
So they're talking about six to 10 awards for that either eight or seven or even six billion, as you'll see on their slide here. Whatever the billion number dollar is, they're talking about six to 10 awards. The anticipated size of the minimum is 400 million. Uh, do not take any of this to the bank. Uh, these numbers have changed 20, 30 times over the course of the last six months. We won't know what these final numbers look like until the DOE tells us what they look like five, six, seven months from now. Uh, the maximum award size would be 1.25 billion. Approximate federal funding, again, there's, see now there's six to seven billion. Uh, anticipated period of performance, eight to 12. Why do we put the number of years down? Uh, the people that you saw on our 1099 committee um, all have ongoing projects within the state. And these are commercial, ready to move, spade in the ground opportunities that these companies are not going to wait eight to 12 years for. Uh, the DOE has specifically stretched that money out for their own purposes and reasons, but it is not to promote spade ready projects. Let's go now. It's to help with the development and the creation and planning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as we've said in our work, uh, this money would be nice in our hydrogen hub, but it's only going to accelerate the projects as opposed to enable them. Um, and the cost share, it's important to note this is not just free. You still have to come up with 50% of whatever it is you ask for in the hydrogen hub submittal. Who's playing? This is again, as I mentioned earlier, Nebraska is not a single standalone state. We've been having conversations with those states that you see highlighted around us um, for several, well, eight, nine months now with some of them. Uh, the final answer to Jeopardy today is that Iowa, Missouri, and Nebraska will make up the mid-continent hydrogen hub. Kansas, just a couple weeks ago, decided to take left turn, exit stage left. And my understanding is they're going to go solo on their own. That is rare. And uh, I wish them the best. And I'll, I'll, just, I'll just stop there. Um, all other states are participating with others. Uh, you look to the, the dark grays, the Wyoming, Colorado's, the Utah's, New Mexico belong to a, an MOU called WISH. They, all, they got cool names. I, I agree. They got better names than I do. Uh, there's another one to the south of us called Halo, which consists of Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma. Uh, so multiple states are piling up on multiple states. There's a Carolinas project. There's an Illinois project. Our friends in North Dakota have quite a project going too. Uh, but the final answer, as I said, for us will be a Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri mid-continent hub proposal. So the process is fiercely competitive. You saw where there's only going to be six or eight or 10, whatever actual awards given, whatever that final number may be. So uh, our guess is probably 50 to 100 minimum applications going into the DOE. You don't have to be a state. You can be a city. You can be a county. You can be a single company and apply for this money from the DOE. But again, the idea from the DOE's perspective is a hub and not only a hub, but then how does your hub connect to the other hubs? Uh, everybody remembers the map I just showed. Nebraska is kind of ideally situated to be in the middle. So if you're going to throw one in West Virginia, you're going to throw one in California, you're going to throw one in Texas, looks good for us to be one of those connecting hubs. Um, we've identified or we are identifying the supply transportation and usage again of the hydrogen and federal dollars, as I mentioned, are to accelerate projects, at least as we stand today. Burns and McDonald, or a division of Burns and McDonald called 1898 and Company, they're helping us put together all those lines and boxes of people who make the hydrogen and people that will use the hydrogen and some of the uh, business cases, if you will, around that. So, you know, you do need to demonstrate to the DOE a successful path forward for those that make and those that use the hydrogen. They just don't want to see somebody making, you know, hydrogen in their backyard with no purpose and no need and, and no, no, no product. Uh, Holland and Knight law firm can't do anything without a law firm in Washington, D.C., and uh, basically, they will be taking what's referred to as a concept paper. You see my last note there. Concept paper is how the DOE takes their first step with this FOA. It's 19 pages. It's very prescriptive. Certain fonts, certain margins, certain page sizes, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, many, many elements that go into that concept paper with uh, only certain numbers of words allowed in each place. I mean, the rather prescriptive on how they want to see those concept papers. But anyway, Holland and Knight have been hired to basically write edit, I should say, edit the final product in the poetry of the DOE. So, and again, conversations with multiple states, as I said on the map before. So, done. <laughs> Thank you, John. And um, in, in a moment, I want to open it up for questions from the audience. So I wanted to make a couple of comments first, and then I had a question um, to highlight a point as well. As, uh, as was mentioned, 
the federal government is really going to be taking a look at the production, the transportation, and the usage of the hydrogen. And they really want to see that all within the regional hub. Um, the usage of the hydrogen is actually going to be one of the areas where some other hubs are going to have some difficulty. Um, thankfully, we have utilization right off the bat in the ag economy. And as John mentioned earlier, this is a great opportunity in agriculture as they're seeking decarbonization as well to use cleaner fertilizer in their processes. But I wanted to start off with a question, John, if you would touch on this. Um, we talk about transportation in two different ways. One, it's an industry that we're targeting. Transportation is uh, surpassed electricity generation actually is the largest carbon emitter. So it's clearly a big target. And as we mentioned, we've got Union Pacific um, and Warner Trucking, as well as Wartzilla in the shipping industry, um, and then sustainable aviation fuel as opportunities here. But let's talk a little bit about actually transporting hydrogen and the difficulties and why the feds want to see the consumption within the regions. You bet. Uh, hydrogen, as it's produced, is in a gaseous form. And it is the smallest and the slipperiest little atom that you would ever want to try to deal with, which means it's hard to compress and it's hard to keep. Uh, hydrogen always looks to get out. Hydrogen always looks to get away. Uh, so consequently, the ability uh, to compress it, especially, and then it's called liquefaction, where you actually take it from a gaseous stage to a liquid phase, uh, can be done. Absolutely. Physics, science, engineering, all done. It's done all day long by various industries around the world. It just every time you touch it, it gets more and more expensive. Bottom line. So if you want to make it here, but your use is in Chicago, forget it. You know, you'll never be able to afford the, the, the liquefaction or whatever it would take to move it in a dense form, that kind of a distance. So, yes, they are looking for production and use relatively close. Uh, that doesn't have to be next door, but uh, it, it's got to be fairly close because otherwise the economics will just eat you alive. So one thing I would add to that is <clears throat> for companies. Oh, I think so. Can you hear me? All right. One thing I would add for that is that. The turning, so for Monolith's facility, we will be turning our ammonia into fertilizer. Right. But depending on where we grow across the country and the world, and you'll see this with other hydrogen companies as well, one way to transport hydrogen is, is in uh, ammonia. And it's, it's easier to transport. So you'll see companies, if you want to ship your hydrogen around the world, you'll do it in the form of ammonia. Very likely. Yep. So now I want to I want to open it up to questions. I, I do have to say one more thing, Courtney. Yeah, I'm sorry. Ahead. When I was going through the basically the energy and the transportation buckets that you saw up there, I forgot to mention my friends from OPPD and LES that are in the room. So Scott and I don't know. I don't see Kirk right off the bat, but uh, again. We don't list the team members out in the various committees, but OPPD and LES are absolutely big players in, in what we've been doing, what we've been doing for several months. Yeah, and one of the um, one of the opportunities is to utilize whether it's hydrogen or one of the products like ammonia or methanol uh, to utilize that for power generation as well and energy storage. It's a great way to store energy. I can talk a little bit to that, and then John would welcome your your input on it. Um, so electrolysis is definitely going to be a key to. Uh, hydrogen's ability to decarbonize the world. There's no doubt in that. Um, with the production tax credit uh, for clean hydrogen, I think you will see some improvements in terms of the price and, and cost of electrolysis. With that said, electrolysis takes a significant, uh, it takes significantly more electricity and power to, uh, to produce a hydrogen molecule, it takes more power to, to split water than it does natural gas when you compare it to steam methane reform or monoliths, methane pyrolysis technology. It also uses a lot more water in terms of the process. And so for certain areas, electrolysis will definitely be the, uh, the technology that is used for producing hydrogen. But in other areas that are more water conscious, 
and also don't have the same capabilities for access to clean power, then you're going to look at other hydrogen technologies is, is probably being more favored. The, the unique opportunity with Monolith is that because we're producing both hydrogen and this solid carbon, this valuable carbon product that we're able to sell, it means for a methane pyrolysis company, even though we have a similar environmental footprint to electrolysis, we're actually able to sell our hydrogen at a competitive rate to the traditional way of producing hydrogen today um, because we're also selling that other valuable product. And so that's where, you know, with electrolysis, their price depends on, on the cost of power and so if you see any increases in that, that's going to increase their price as well. But again, I think that with the PTC, with the production tax credit and ITC that passed, you're going to see a driving down of the cost of electrolysis uh, in the United States, and, and you will see more plants come online. Thank Nothing you. To add. Thanks, John and Anna. Um, so I'll scan the room, and I've got a mic here. So I'll come around um, to ask for other questions in the interim as I'm walking. John, do you want to? We touched on earlier the colors of hydrogen, but do you want to talk? Do you want to speak briefly again? I don't not remember not about in colors, here. Though. Earlier upstairs, okay. they touched on the colors of hydrogen. But do you want to walk through that again for in the, the audience? In the beginning, rather than talking about carbon intensity of the hydrogen produced. People just started referring to colors of hydrogen. Uh, we've already mentioned, I'm sorry, we did talk about gray and blue hydrogen. Uh, that's kind of how it's done today. Uh, blue with carbon capture, gray with no carbon capture on it at all. Uh, the monolith hydrogen, since it involves green and blue, we call turquoise. That's actually, I think you use that someplace. I think it's on your website or something now. Uh, if you produce your hydrogen and electrolysis using nuclear power, you have pink hydrogen. Um, Let's see, green, of course, hydrogen is produced solely from renewable or carbon-free energy. Uh, let's see, Roman, Jed, how I many others? That's it. I think that's There's it. lots of colors out there. <laughs> the, one, the one thing I wanted to add, and it was mentioned today by the speaker who was talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, and, and I spent a lot of time uh, working, working on this and, and actually had some meetings with Senator Wyden himself when he was coming, when he was pushing for a tech neutral approach. And it's really, <clears throat> it's really quite amazing the, the direction the United States took with this policy and pushing for a tech neutral approach that instead pushes for results in terms of emission reduction. Because you're seeing in other countries where policy will call out one specific type of technology for a incentive. And the problem with that is then you stifle any future innovations that are going on because it's so specific to a point in time. And this country took a very different step and it's one where you're going to see, and I feel very lucky to work for a company where we talk about the fact that it's not just going to be Monolith that solves this issue. And it's not just going to be all the companies that are out there today. It's going to be all the future innovations, probably some that exist in, the, in your brains here in this room, that come online. And what's exciting is that as a country, we've taken a direction of incentivizing results in terms of our incentives, as opposed to calling out specific types of technologies. And I think you're going to see a ton of innovation going on in the next, uh, in the next couple of years in terms of the clean tech space. Is the uh, hub going to look at options for hydrogen storage uh, you know, particularly as it relates to using it as a means of electricity storage? There's different kinds. Anna already mentioned if you want to turn it into ammonia, uh, you can store hydrogen that way and then crack the ammonia to reduce, you get the hydrogen back out of the molecule, the nitrogen molecule, or the ammonia molecule. Uh, there's also geological storage. And I know our friends in Kansas are looking at the appropriate geology to store either ammonia or hydrogen. That's very specific geology uh, that typically Nebraska does not have. Uh, and now that we're, we're uh, teaming up with the states of uh, Iowa and Missouri, we'll have to do a little more work with their geologies as well. I don't think Iowa offers much based on their CO2 sequestration work, 
But I think Missouri actually has talked about opportunities in the south part of the state where the geology would be receptive. Uh, and that's the trick. If you're going to try to do geological storage, it's got to be the right rock. It's got to be the right top cap rock to hold it. It's got to be the right bottom rock to keep it in place. And the right porosities and permeabilities of the material that you're putting that hydrogen or ammonia into for it to be there when you want to take it back out. So, again, hydrogen will get away. It's the smallest, and it, it shows. Uh, will the hydrogen hub work on uh, cleaning up the natural gas sources? Because one of the problems right now with, with methane and natural gas is leakage uh, at the sites where it's produced and in transit and so on. Well, for those of you who don't know, the person who just asked that question is Senator Ken, former Senator Ken Har, who was, uh, who was my one of my first bosses. So it's, <laughs> and frankly, one of the people that in, inspired me in in terms of looking at uh, the the importance of environmental policy. So to answer your question, I can answer specifically to, to Monolith and then talk a little, well, first I'll talk a little broader policy-wise. Included in the Fl Inflation Reduction Act was a methane tax. So I think what you're going to see is you're going to see companies that are um, incentivized to reduce emissions. And so I think you're going to see that happen over the, the course of the years. In terms of monolith, um, we are committed to looking at what's called responsibly sourced natural gas. Now, it's still a new uh, certification scheme in, in terms of life cycle analysis and proving out. Um, but really what it means is working with natural gas providers um, that are committed to reducing emissions uh, upstream. And, and so I think you're going to see more and more of that. Um, and a lot, again, of the policy, because it incentivizes companies to reduce their emissions in their full life cycle of emissions, so all the way upstream, you're going to see more companies that are pushing their upstream providers to be able to help them meet um, the standards they need to meet to get those incentives. So I think over the next couple of years, Senator, you're going to see a lot of that happening. So you're also Yes, it's called responsibly sourced gas, and it's basically clean natural gas. And then, and then obviously there's the opportunities with renewable natural gas as well, as Amy discussed, blending that in. And thank you, Anna, and thanks for mentioning renewable natural gas. I wonder, John, if you wanted to speak a little bit to some of the work that we're doing on renewable natural gas and some work that we're doing with the university as well. A, a huge opportunity for an ag state, um, whether that's methane coming off of um, production livestock. But did you wanna to touch on opportunities there? Again, this is really, we're looking at a full life cycle um, for our hydrogen hub application. Agriculture is a critical component of that and there are opportunities for re renewable natural gas as well. Yes, renewable natural gas does not carry with it the penalty that other natural gas does. Uh, just like CO2 off one of my power plants is different from the CO2 off an ethanol plant. Uh, so mind your colors, uh, mind your sources. Life cycle analysis is everything as, as we move forward. And yes, being the heavy ag state that we are, yes, hog confinements, yes. Uh, the cattle uh, business is still more difficult because they don't necessarily have uh, cattle on concrete and the dirt in the manure is still an issue that retards the production of the renewable natural gas. All this stuff we're learning with uh, Dr. Erickson and his staff out on East Campus, the work that we support and uh, work with them out there. We actually had a test uh, on uh, carbon black, no, black Biochar, thank you, Roman. Uh, in terms of using it as a very small percentage in animal feed to reduce the methane produced by the cattle. Um, don't, don't kill me for this. The fart barn uh, was used on East Campus to measure the, uh, if you will, what the cattle were doing after they'd been fed normal feed, normal rations, with a very, very, very small percentage of, uh, of uh, biochar then, which is nothing but carbon, oops, nothing but carbon. And it was used to do a methane reduction in the animal's digestive tract is what it was for. So yes, we have all kinds of things going on out there, uh, including uh, some work that Mr. Jed Fisher's been doing in the back of the room here too, with all renewable natural gas. 
uh, and opportunities within the state with the hog confinements and the cattle and even cattle on not on grate or cattle not on concrete. That's where the rest of the work is going now. So, Kim. Um, well, the question I had uh, was following up on a question I asked this morning. Um, it, I understand based upon the response this morning that, that it's not cost effective to uh, repower Sheldon Station, but but uh, energy is is a uh, potential use for hydrogen, and it could be a very uh, what well, could really be a, a very important use. What what would be the factors that would lead to it becoming cost effective to use hydrogen as an energy generation source? Price. <laughs> um, we are anytime, uh, for instance, I'll, uh, with our, our natural gas partners that are on our hub team with us, uh, they would love to come in and take natural gas and produce hydrogen from that and, and store the carbon dioxide, sequester the carbon dioxide. So it's a very low carbon intensity fuel. But you already start with natural gas and we already make electricity with natural gas, like Beatrice Power Station, for instance. So you take the hydrogen or excuse me, you take the natural gas and process and process and process and turn it into hydrogen. You don't make it cheaper. In fact, you increase the cost like by a factor of eight. So the fuel costs go up by a factor of eight makes it really hard for me and anybody in this room that pays an electric bill to say, that's my option. That's my choice. That's the one I want to pick. Now, that's the rules today. And the rules change every day in terms of the carbon intensity of the fuel, the carbon intensity of the megawatt hours that we produce and who's willing to pay for what. So I know that's a generic answer, Ken, but that's that's all I got. Although I think to add to that story, again, beyond the pure hydrogen, we've got opportunities for methanol, yes. for ammonia, and we are researching all of those. Again, those are easier to store, um, and we uh, are working with companies like Wartzilla on engines that can use different sources of fuel. So a tie to the hydrogen hub, perhaps not using hydrogen directly. Another question over here. Could you touch just briefly on the EJ goals that we hope to have? Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about that. So to to back up, where the the reason, well, there are many reasons why we we should be focusing on environment and justice. In terms of the the hydrogen hub, it's part of a broader strategy from the Biden administration. It's called the Justice 40 Initiative. And for those who, of you who are not familiar with that, what the administration said is that 40% of all funds that, that come from the federal government are committed to going to support communities that are most disadvantaged historically and in the future um, from environmental hazard, hazards, degradation, from climate change, and then those communities that because of the energy transition, there's gonna be a significant amount of job loss. So you think about like the coal communities in West Virginia is an example of that. And so when you're thinking about 40% of all federal funds, this crosses almost every single agency uh, in the federal government, but in particular, it covers the Department of Energy, as you can imagine, because the DOE is most responsible for a lot of the funding programs that are, are associated with decarbonization and addressing climate change. And so what that looks like in terms of the hydrogen hub is a lot of different opportunities. So some of the things that they're pushing for and things that we're interested in is one, collaboration with tribal nations. Um, that is a major component of hydrogen hubs and you're gonna see that across the country, opportunities for collaboration there. Um, so we are just in initial conversations, but that is an opportunity, for example, um, collaborating uh, potentially with some of the uh, community colleges, the tri tribal community colleges. Now, again, this is just an example of something that we, we would like to continue conversations on. 
Uh, another is making sure that investments go into, again, areas that are most disadvantaged. Um, so we've talked a lot of, with Omaha Public Power Distri District about opportunities um, in areas uh, that have some health issues. And then when you look at rural Nebraska as well, um, areas that have been disadvantaged by climate change. Um, you know, the exciting thing, and again, one of the reasons why I was so excited to work at Monolith is that we are the example of a the energy transition done in the right way in the sense that these are generational jobs. We're often a landing pad for people who are coming out of industries that are not going to exist in, in the future and they get to land and have a generational job with us. And so that's really when you're looking at this Justice 40 initiative, that's really the goal of that happening across the country. And, and there's a lot of opportunities here in Nebraska. And Courtney didn't know if you wanted to add anything else. No, I think you did a, a great job. It's very broad and we have a lot of opportunities. And beyond Nebraska, we'll be looking um, to work with our partners in Iowa and in Missouri as well. Um, still crossing my fingers for one other state that's going to join us, um, <laughs> hopefully in the um, not too distant future. Um, but another area, and Anna touched on it, is public health and what are the opportunities. And so we actually have a professor from UNMC of public health who is on our committee and um, already identifying opportunities and efforts uh, that are underway with partners in Iowa and Missouri from a public health perspective. Okay, and feel free to come up and, and speak with us after, but let's give our panelists a round of applause.